afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and of course, also to the St. Lucian public listening to us on NTN Live, live on YouTube, and also on Facebook. Welcome to today's press conference with Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, and the Public Service, Honorable Alan Shastney. Welcome, Honorable Prime Minister, and thank you for joining us here today. Great to be here. Today's press conference will take the format of covering four major areas. We will cover hurricane relief, an overview of our participation at UNGA 72, and also economic and social issues. Amongst one of our first issues down for discussion is obviously hurricane relief efforts throughout the Caribbean. I will now invite the Prime Minister, who is also Chairman of the OECS, to give us a synopsis <coughs> of relief efforts ever since we got, um, Dominica got hit by Hurricane Maria, and obviously the rest of the Caribbean got hit by Hurricane Irma. I now turn you over to the Prime Minister. Well, thank you very much. Um, I first of all, I want to thank uh, Didikas Jules, the Secretary General of the OECS, for an incredible job that he's been doing. And about two days before Irma struck the region um, and was uh, Mr. Jules and I met um, to have a discussion to go through the, the, the plan of preparedness. And I have to say that OECS traditionally has not played a role with that. It's been really more at the CARICOM level and, and the SEDEMA level. Uh, but after we discussed it, we recognized that there were some shortfalls in the overall plan. And I think it's something hopefully that we're going to incorporate in future future hurricane seasons. And, and that is, we're very good at having disaster plans for each destination. But in terms of looking at the region holistically, um, there was a huge shortcoming. We were anticipating at the time that uh, Irma was going to potentially take out Guadeloupe, Antigua, St. Kitts, while still heading north. But that's what it looked like initially. And what we had learned from Hurricane Thomas um, is that, that if those countries are out and the airports are out, the ability to extract people becomes very important. So the hotel guest, many of those destinations have um, <coughs> universities, and then there's also the people at, ho at, ho at hospitals, and anybody who may have been potentially injured. How do you get them out of the destination? And, and what we understood was that Irma was going to be still heading north. It was heading to Puerto Rico. so the places that would have immediately provided relief to us more than likely would not be available. Um, as it was even getting closer, Miami was already starting to shut down. So we knew instinctively that the South would be critical. And so we had discussions with Martinique, St. Lucia, and Barbados in terms of making our airports ready. And then all the things that would go along with that. So for instance, cargo space at the airport and also at the docks. So if in fact supplies were coming in, we immediately would have the ability to getting those supplies to those destinations. Um, if people were arriving here, we would need hotel rooms. So a full inventory was done of all available hotel rooms. And the Hotels Association really were very, very responsive in that regard. We met with uh, Digicel and Lime because when people, we know that when people come from a hurricane disaster area, more than likely they've been out of communication for a couple of days and the first phone call they want to make is to their loved ones. So the idea was to create um, data banks so that if, if we were going to be an evacuation center that we would be prepared. I, I want to emphasize that all this work was being done in conjunction with Sidema. So at no point did we um, deviate or do something outside of Sidema because Sidema really takes on the full responsibility of the disaster relief. So once the hurricane um, had passed now Antigua, in which we heard the disastrous impact on Barbuda, um, there were some initial in, uh, uh, out fallouts in St. Kitts. Um, and then obviously we'd heard about the BVI and Anguilla. Um, and luckily it had skirted Puerto Rico. Um, but it was now heading to Miami. And Miami now was on a full shutdown. And immediately coming behind Irma, was Jose. 
At the same time, we were now getting assistance from Mexico as one of the countries that were sending planes over here and troops over here to help us. There was the earthquake in Mexico. So all of a sudden, that relief um, came to a grinding halt. And the only um, country that was really available to us was Venezuela. And so the Venezuelans provided uh, heavy equipment in terms of planes and also helicopters to be able to facilitate with the evacuation of Barbuda. We then quickly were trying to assess um, how bad the situation was. And there were more shortcomings in our overall disaster relief um, strategy. The, the critical one is the independent countries, the British territories, the US territories, the Dutch, and the French. That I was thinking, I'm probably like everybody else, that there was a, a greater level of coordination and protocols had already been established in case of a hurricane. So to my dismay, and I think to many people, it wasn't. So in fact, when I went up to the BVI, I think it's almost six days after the hurricane had passed, was the first day that Dima was actually making it into the BVI. That you look at the Dutch Antilles in that um, Holland was trying to facilitate uh, a support program out of Curacao, of all places, and it was being directed by Hague back in, in Europe. Whereas you've got Guadeloupe, which was nearby, which is part of Europe. And so um, I think that the difficulties that were happening there was uh, a surprise, and maybe we've never had what I call the perfect storm. Um, what was also very interesting was when we met, um, so as the chairman of OECS, with the support of my other prime minister colleagues, when we were having discussions with the British and the French and the Dutch and also the US territories, we were very emphatic in saying to them that we have a vested interest in the outcome of what's happening in these destinations. Because there are thousands of our citizens who live and work in those destinations. Um, many of our, of, our, of our economic output is vested in those countries. A lot of our farmers are exporting products to those destinations. And the cruise industry um, requires all of us in the Eastern Caribbean to be working collaboratively together. So we indicated to them that we were not going to be put on the outside of the room, that we were going to insist that we were sitting at the table, and also to say to them that we're here to help. Um, don't think that because it's a British territory or a French ter 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 territory or a Dutch territory that we would not be willing to help. And that's why one of the first things that we did in St. Lucia was when I heard about the status of the prisons um, and clearly understanding how many St. Lucians and how many other citizens of the Eastern Caribbean are there and fearing for their own safety, we immediately offered the assistance of being able to bring the prisoners to St. Lucia. So once we were um, six days after the hurricane, myself and um, Prime Minister Skerritt, along with the Secretary General, visited Anguilla um, and the BVI, Antigua and St. Kitts, and uh, you know, it was, it was shocking. Um, and I think that the error in our ways in not treating um, infrastructure as a crisis was very evident. So you could see the bad planning, you could see the bad standards of, of construction. Um, I mean, literally, there was nothing left. I mean, in speaking to some of the people there, they almost said this wasn't a hurricane, this was a tornado, because the way that the wind was going. And you go to a landscape in which there isn't one leaf on the tree. So it's just brown, the whole place. Um, and there's galvanized all over the place. In the case of the BVI, not hundreds, but thousands of boats spewed all over the island, and in some cases, almost like they were in a junkyard piled on top of each other. And it was the absolute sense of helplessness by many people in terms of, of, of what was going to happen. And I think that many of us here in St. Lucia can relate to that when we woke up uh, from Tomas and that the bridges were gone. It almost felt, boy, St. Lucia was finished. Now, this is six days after the fact that the place was still looking in shambles and people were still running around and I think that that's the shortcoming of the situation I explained with um, Sedima not being uh, established protocol of some of these countries. So immediately after that we um, then had um, Maria mm -hmm. coming down the pipeline 
And uh, I was not on island, uh, but I was in constant contact with um, the acting prime minister, uh, Minister Matut, um, and obviously learning from our overall experiences. And I think that you didn't know where this, this, uh, this storm, because remember it was a thunderstorm, was going to go. And they've become so unpredictable, one in terms of direction, and obviously in terms of strength, because in speaking to friends of mine in Dominica, that you're sitting in your home, anticipating a thunderstorm, and then three hours before it was a category two, as it reached the southern tip of, of Dominica, it became a category five, which means you literally have no time to react to any of this stuff. So when I hear some people being attempting to be critical of the decision to shut down the country and to send people home to prepare, the question I want to ask them is, it's the loss of time, yes, but if we had not and we'd been hit by that hurricane, what would have happened? And, and how many people potentially would have lost their lives? And so when we make those decisions, um, it's difficult to say it's a risk and reward situation when you're dealing with people's lives. Um, and I think that if people have more time to prepare their homes, then there's a greater likelihood that they could potentially be less damaged. Although I think with that storm, it would be very difficult for anything to have stood up to it. Um, the decision for me not to return home um, was made in conjunction with my Prime Minister colleagues. That somebody needed to be the voice on the outside to get relief, but more importantly, to start to build the case after the next step. So I think that we've become very good at the initial emergency part of the situation. Getting water, getting supplies, getting medical stuff. You saw a huge mobilization. St. Lucia immediately opened up its doors, like we had prior to um, with Irma. Um, no landing fees, um, free cargo sheds, waived all the duties of things coming in, waived any uh, requirements for people to need visas, to be able to facilitate, um, opened up our, our parking aprons, um, to be able to immediately help with the, 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 the aftermath um, in Dominica. But the longer term plan is where is the money going to come from to resolve this issue? And we in the Caribbean, along with other small developing states around the world, have been saying for a long time that there's an organization called the OECD that has used one criteria to determine whether a country is a low-income country, middle-income country, or a high-income country. And that criteria is per capita income. And we're saying that this is too important because that, that designation determines where you can get money from and how much you're going to pay, pay, pay for it. And we've been classified as middle-income. Antigua is actually on the verge of becoming a high-income country. And so therefore, the sources of funds and, and how much we can get and what's the interest rate we're going to pay and what's the terms have been determined by being a middle-income country. So it's restricted. So we've been arguing that the OECD should use a vulnerability index as well. So for the smaller developing states, um, that the impact of shocks, whether it be uh, an increase in the price of oil, whether it be the recession that took place in 2008, or whether it be a hurricane or um, an epidemic has the ability literally within hours to wipe out our economies and we don't have the reserves or the resilience to be able to handle that and so therefore um, we should be able to get access to lower concessionary funds if not grant funds particularly for we call it resilience building so whether it's strengthening our economies whether it's fixing up our infrastructure and so the message that I was carrying outside of St. Lucia was starting to pave the way for that discussion. And so that led us into the UNG, but uh, I certainly do, I don't want to enter that because I know that's the next topic of discussion. So yes. certainly from a disaster perspective, that's where we... So we have a roving microphone on the ground. Please introduce yourself as you ask your questions. Are there any questions related to um, our hurricane relief efforts? Yes, Ms. Ford, 
the prisoners coming in from the BVI. Can you confirm a number, a number first, the final number we're expecting, and how many have come in so far? And then, uh, with Dominica in mind, particularly, is there any move? I mean, national or governmental level to try to facilitate students uh, as our sister countries have done. So, um, when I first met with you, and I indicated to you publicly that I had made this offer to um, BVI and to the British government. Uh, I indicated that we had done an audit and there were spaces for about 40 to 50 people in Border Lake. The, the second thing was, I said, if in fact we needed to bring more people, that we felt that we could take the free zone, we have some empty warehouses there, and we could have converted them temporarily into a prison. It means you can put port a we'd have brought in some additional security services and certainly I'm sure that the British and other people would have lent us um, forces on it. So the capacity could have been potentially higher. Um, I also indicated that after making that offer that I had not heard back in terms of a number. So the first request that we got was from Turks and Caicos, which was for three prisoners. Um, and I'm, I'm bringing up questions because I think they're valid questions. And so hopefully we can bring clarity to it. The, the valid question was, why would they come here? If they're British dependent states, why wouldn't those people just be sent back to England? I mean, they certainly had sufficient time to have done that. That was certainly an option on the table. And it was the Premier's decision to try to keep the people in the Caribbean. And the reason is because they also have an obligation to give what they call visitation rights. And so they felt that keeping them here would allow them to fulfill that obligation easier. So the initial request was for three. Um, while I was away, um, the uh, BVI then got back to us, and I think it went between 19 and 24. So I think that that's about where we are. Is it 19 or 24 people? I think it's 17 and 24. The 17 yeah. and 24. So um, we're certainly well below the number that we uh, have capacity for. Um, we're certainly willing to take more once it with fulfills that capacity. And if it has to be more above that, as I said to you, we would work with the, those governments in making a facility in the free zone available. Um, I've not heard there any expectations that it would be much more than that. Um, but I just want to say to you that I, I can't give you one number. It's a moving target. Um, as the need arises, we're certainly going to be here standing by to facilitate them. In terms of education with the kids, the great thing is there was a precedent established <coughs> after the hurricane in, <coughs> in Dominica, Grenada. sorry, in Grenada, um, Ivan in which Form 4s and Form 5s were adopted by the islands, and the kids came to live here, some of them here in St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the other islands. <clears throat> so we've already initiated that. In fact, um, uh, the Minister of Education is accompanying to meet with me tomorrow on a trip to go and meet uh, Prime Minister Skerritt, his cabinet, um, to see if we can facilitate that. We've also extended um, uh, a request or support for women having babies. You know, these are simpler things, but maybe <laughs> Not, life doesn't c stop, and there are some, some simpler things that maybe we forget. So I, I've, I've indicated to Dominica and to the Prime Minister that St. Lucia is Dominica. Whatever we can do to help, we'll be there. Dale? My name is Dale, I from Stories. My question is, what has St. Lucia done? two tangible things we've done to assist Dominica, St. Lucia government? Well, the first thing that we did was to open up a communications channel because Dominica was out. Um, we were in communications through VHS, um, through some of the ham radio people here. Um, and as I said to you, immediately, I mean, we didn't even wait to open up St. Lucia as a platform, as a hub. So uh, teams of search dogs, and uh, experts to find people in landslides were based here, just waiting to be able to get to Dominica because we didn't know the air status of the airport, which I suspected would have not been operational. So therefore, the government of Trinidad immediately sent their helicopter, which was based here in San Lucia. That was the first thing. The second thing that we've done is to, in terms of supplies. So we basically met with the private sector here, um, with the Minister of Agriculture, and had container loads of product going over 
in terms of water, um, in terms of food supplies, particularly non-perishable food supplies. Uh, the next thing that, that happened <coughs> was the Bailey Bridges. So as they did an assessment, the problem they were continuously having is they couldn't get access to the whole country. So they were, the helicopter needed to bring things in, but then the helicopter needed to be able to carry things from the port to each of the different areas. So the key was to try to get communication, land communication or land access available as much as possible. So we made that available. Um, there was the Ross School University. Um, we worked with the Hotels Association here, Customs and Immigration, to facilitate Canadians and Americans and everybody else from the school to come into St. Lucia. Some of them had to spend a couple of nights um, while the transportation was being organized for them to be able to get out. 1,700 overall. 1,700 overall. So, uh, you know, for me, we reacted as if it was Soufra in St. Lucia. Whatever we could do, we did it. Our firemen went over, um, loose like people went over, um, Wasco people went over, um, everybody. We, I mean, we literally, almost to a, a point, didn't think of ourselves and we thought about Dominica. We did it because I knew what was happening in the U.S. territories and the British territories and that they would not have maybe been as responsive. But I have to say to you that the Canadians and the Americans, um, despite my, uh, my concerns, did come to the table in a significant way and immediately. Um, I also have to say that the president of, uh, of Martinique, Mr. Uh, Marie-Jean, was amazing. I mean, he was over there immediately. We worked collaboratively together um, to be able to facilitate um, people who were injured to get them out because clearly they were people who needed immediate me medical assistance. The helicopters, I mean it was the Martinicans that sent a jet over a couple of times to try to do an audit of what was going on in the territory, then sending over a helicopter. And so we were working collaboratively together. Um, so we were intimately involved and remain intimately involved with what's taking place in Dominica. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> yes, Mr. PM, um, Reginald Andrew de Mira. Yeah, if, if St. Lucia now um, has a sort of, um, how you say, rescue hub, the, whether for the short term or the long term, would we be um, able to establish like a permanent base where we could facilitate these movements in and out and you know, properly manned and security in place? Well, I'm going to be able to get a better feel for that tomorrow. I'm going to be spending the day in Dominica. Um, but my initial assessments that I've been getting from, from third party people is that it's very, very bad. And it's going to take a while for Dominica to be able to recover. So even when you think of it from an agricultural perspective, you know, even when we had Tomas, you know, people could still go out and find food. There's nothing there. All the leaves are gone. So you're literally having to start all over again. Um, so there's not a sense that there can be this immediate recovery. My understanding, none of the major businesses opened up. The hotels are gone. Um, so you're talking about the entire economy is, is destroyed. Um, and and, and he, Dominica has a, a long, long road ahead. Um, then there's the migration problem. So many people are leaving. We're seeing the same thing in the BVI. We're seeing the same thing in Anguilla. We're seeing the same thing in St. Martin, St. Thomas. You know, there was a study that was done by the IMF that showed that after these big disasters, that the population decreases by on average 5.5%. So that's the next big problem is how do you keep your population there, keep the confidence that's going. So to your point, I think that St. Lucia is going to have to play an important role. And it's almost like we become an incubator. And maybe some of the businesses move over temporarily to St. Lucia. And we allow those companies to continue growing so that when the infrastructure gets back up in Dominica, they can migrate back up to Dominica. So it's almost like a plant. You know, you're taking it, you're putting it in a pot, you're nurturing it, and then you're allowed to, re, to re, replant it. We're doing the same thing with the BVI. I mean, I, I have a very long meeting um, I have to go to with uh, Premier Orlando Smith about his financial services. That Solution is prepared to work with him. I, and I don't want it to ever be seen that, you know, we're out trying to pillage people in the time of, of, of a disaster. But 
I think that to your point, we can become an incubator and we can allow some of those businesses to continue to flourish um, so that once those countries have gotten their feet under them again, we can then transfer those businesses back into their destination. Okay. Do we have any other questions on the hurricane relief? Yeah. Miguel, quickly before we move on. Yeah, you can. That's true. So it was one of the first things that happened when we were, you know, I want to thank the Chief Justice, um, Justice Pereira. She did an amazing job um, uh, of being incredibly persistent in getting her judges out. Um, and they came uh, to request of whether they could transfer the, uh, the commercial court to San Lucia. We obviously immediately agreed. Um, and that facilitation has already taken place. And again, it's an incubator. You know, that's, you know, not intended to be a permanent move. But once BVI can get its feet back up on the ground, the infrastructure is there, it will be transferred back to the BVI. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. We will now move on to the second segment of our press conference. Prime Minister, we know you just came back from the 72nd session of the United Nations General Assembly. We all, most of us watched your presentation. Can you go through us um, parts of your presentation, why you said what you said, what, was, what did we achieve at that session? And also, we know you had several investment meetings in the U.S. and also when you proceeded to Canada. If you could take us through that. So after I got back to St. Lucia, after visiting um, the BVI, um, Anguilla, uh, St. Kitts and Antigua, um, I was uh, scheduled to have a meeting with American Airlines, which had been scheduled prior to this, uh, to this event, because we were trying to, if, you, if you've seen the tourism arrivals for St. Lucia, you would see that our arrivals are up 10% for the year, land-based arrivals. And the U.S. is up 6%. Canada has continued to grow. Um, and we have not even got into stride yet with our marketing, marketing program. So I really want to thank the minister and, and Agnes Francis and, and the group there because it's very difficult when you're going through a transition to also keep your eye on the ball. But I think they've done a remarkable job of doing two things at the same time. So we were trying to anticipate that we're seeing a growing demand from the U.S. Um, and that we needed more capacity. So that was, we were going up to meet with American. Um, Agnes and, and the minister had already met with American Airlines. Given my background in the airline industry and obviously in tourism, was to really reinforce um, what they had said to them. And, and there was, and people would say, well, why are you wasting your time? Because those have already gone up. It's a whole new executive in American Airlines. And American Airlines had merged with U U US Air. So it was important to reconnect with all those new executives because they, they, they hold our future in their hands. So on the way there, I went to uh, Cayman. I went to Cayman for two reasons. One, um, obviously, hot topic in, in, a, in, a, in a discussion today is St. Jude's. Um, I had gotten a preliminary report on St. Jude's, and after receiving that report, I wanted to see what uh, a hospital facility ought to look like. You know, so I'm very glad I was able to go there. While I was there, I was able to meet with the Deputy Premier, talking about Cayman Airways, um, talked about financial services, um, and talked about a closer linking with us and some of the problems that we had with the independent countries. So uh, we then went to Turks and Caicos, and um, Charlene is the new Premier there. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of hers. And just to basically, as Chairman of, of, of OECS, and on behalf of the Prime Minister, Keith Mitchell, as chairman of the CARICOM to go and just visit them because they had the hurricane there. Um, and Minister Guy Joseph actually remained the night there and helped, went through some tours. I then went to Dallas. Um, I was hoping to have gone to Houston. It's the second time I was in the state of Texas after the hurricane, Harvey. Um, and, but I, my understanding is I'm now finally going to get to see them uh, later in, in October. Uh, we had a very, very good meeting with American, and afterwards I went to Philadelphia. And again, that was a, uh, a scheduled trip that had been prearranged. I was meeting with Jay, who is the um, Pandey, who is the uh, owner of the Stars. So you know, I wanted to get uh, a post mortem on what had happened and where we feel that we could go. And I have to say to you, he's an incredible business person. Um, he owns over 3,000 franchises is doing all kinds of developments and extremely well respected and very connected. Um, he put on a function for me with about 35 business people. Um, and also he made connections with the congressmen and mayors from the Philadelphia area. 
So that was a very worthwhile endeavor, and I'm, I'm going to be announcing some very exciting plans that we have with Jay and with the stars moving forward. So I'm, I mean, very, very exciting plans for Solution. At the UN, um, I had the opportunity, obviously with a very clear mission in mind. One was to get the support necessary for this re-designation of our islands in terms of getting access to money. Secondly, that where's the source of money going to come from? So can there be a special allocation of funds um, put on the table uh, that we can access? And then the third part of that is can we reduce the level of bureaucracy so that we can get the money quickly? What's happened to the world, everybody's so concerned about corruption that the, the processes are actually more leaning towards corruption prevention and accountability than it is in terms of what the money was supposed to do in the first place. So this, the meeting started off with a very important meeting where we had a meeting with uh, Boris Johnson from the UK. Um, we met uh, with the Americans, the Deputy Under Secretary was there. Um, we had the uh, French, the French Ambassador to the UN and also the uh, Minister of, of Foreign Affairs for um, Holland was also there. And it was a very good opportunity because they had the same problem we had. They were not allowed to take their development aid money and send it to their dependents because of that same classification. So I think that now that we had their attention, it was much easier to get into the second and third part, which is the source of monies and the bureaucracy. Um, so there was an absolute commitment from that meeting that there would be a follow-up high-level meeting, which was supposed to be in England, but we recommended that that meeting take place in Washington, D.C., which is now scheduled for the 14th of October in Washington, D.C. And so that meeting is going to be chaired by the World Bank, but we'll have all of the major countries in the world, and I'm hoping that that's where the decision will be made to support this initiative. Now, it's important to note that when I met with the UN Secret uh, uh, General Secretary, who used to be a minister in Portugal, had indicated that there was precedence for what we were doing. That Jordan, which was also a middle-income country, that when they had the migration uh, from Syria, the, uh, the invasion, whatever you want to call it, the surge in migration from Syria, they were then reclassified as a developing state to get access to funds. So it's for us to bring those, that information to the table, and hopefully we can push. So we were able to get a lot of support at that opportunity. Um, I had some friends of mine who um, worked at MSNBC, and um, they called me up and asked me if I would do this interview. And at the interview, it was very important for me to learn from my past experiences. No matter how much we cry publicly and lament how much the hurricane has damaged us and the, the impact on family lives, it's not going to change how much money we're going to get. States like ours get money by making applications to development agencies. So they send down audit teams and everything else. But also as countries that are dependent on tourism, that when you're out there saying there's a disaster, at the same time what you're doing is saying to people, stay away. So it's just catch-22. And so that I kept on using the word that the Caribbean was resilient, that we're a proud people, okay? And that there is a brotherhood in the Caribbean. Because what you didn't want the people to believe that these are little independent countries on their own. That you want them to know that there is a bigger network of people that are committed to being able to get them off the ground. And I think that all too often we use those opportunities to promote ourselves. And I, mean, I don't mean individually, but our own country. And, and I described it in all my meetings is that the Caribbean is an ecosystem, very tightly knit ecosystem, and that we're all dependent on each other. So if you take the cruise industry, if Puerto Rico is not working as a home port, it means that the ships that are, des are de designated to the Eastern Caribbean can't come. If there is not enough destination, so if USVI and St. Martin um, and BVI are not up and operating, it's going to have an impact on us. I've already indicated that there are thousands of St. Lucians and Vincentians and Grenadians and Antiguans who are living and working in those destinations who are now probably going to migrate home, migrate somewhere else, but meanwhile, the remittances that they were sending back home are, 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 are disappear. So that's how our ecosystem works. And so therefore, we're all in this thing together. And that's the same message I carried through on my UN speech. But the twist in the UN, UN speech was really to say this, that the world has adopted the SDGs, 
17 SDGs, Special Development Goals. And my speech was to say that those are very valuable and very important goals that we ought to have. But if people can't put food on their plate, if they don't have a roof over their head, if they don't know where their kids are going to go to school, if they don't have access to medical facilities, I don't think they're going to be thinking about SDG goals. They're dealing with the day-to-day -day crisis. And the UN was created in order to have prevent a third world war. And the, the, the first world war and the second world war was caused because there wasn't dialogue. So the UN was to create an opportunity where there would be dialogue, in which uh, countries would be helped to resolve their problems, that there could be a level of consensus. But in my mind, that the greatest danger that we have moving forward is inequity. And should we not now have a measurement call, a minimum standard of living, that all people in the world deserve to have that? And shouldn't that be the priority of any one state to ensure that every single citizen has ac access to what we call basic human needs? Because we can't grow. So when you look at the migration problems, when you hear that there's not 20 million Africans that are hungry, 20 million Africans that are starving. And understand the desperation that that creates. That a person who can't swim, their wife can't swim, their kids can't swim, but they're prepared to get into a boat in hopes that they can make it to the other end. And how many thousands of people, because they must have heard the stories, have drowned in attempting to do that and are still willing to take that chance. Is it fair to say that countries are coming to the UN to try to vote and discuss issues, but their own people are starving? And are they really going to be interested in listening to all the other heavier talks? So it was really to put that out there um, and to try to get the world to start thinking of this reform of the UN from a very different way. So we always say that it's important before you design something, you must understand what you're trying to achieve. So we say design before form okay, is a very important concept I truly believe in. So there is a reform a movement taking place of which St. Lucia was a signatory to it. Um, there was a meeting with President Trump and uh, several of the world leaders um, to re-emphasize um, our, 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 our support for that. I'm very happy that the General Secretary who is in is also committed to that overall reform. Uh, and then uh, at the UN meeting, I also had bilaterals. I had an incredible bilateral with the uh, President of Estonia. Um, and she's an amazing lady. I mean, I, I could have sat there for hours talking to her. She used to be an auditor for the, uh, the EU. And Estonia has um, the first paperless government in the world, three and a half million people. And what's interesting about their IT system is that everybody's information is available online but it's only accessible through permission. So if the state wants to get information from you, they must request it. So it is fully protective of your individual rights as a citizen. So I'm very much looking forward to following up dialogue with her in terms of, of seeing how we can get that transfer. The president, uh, Prime Minister of Malta, another great guy, and going through the same problems that we're going through with CIP and correspondent bankings because they have a very aggressive CIP program over in Malta and we've also agreed to be able to follow up in that regard. So following the UN um, I had the opportunity to go to Canada. Um, I had been scheduled prior to the hurricanes to go to Canada and my the first in intention of the Canadian visit was to meet with the Canadian banks. So we were meeting with um, the governor of the central bank. We met with um, CIBC, with Royal Bank of Canada and Bank of Nova Scotia and it was a very interesting, enlightening meeting, um, and I'm looking forward to hopefully a lot of good things coming out of that. The primary thing, and, I, and you know, I've received mixed reviews with the statement that your, our patrimony is connected to our credit rating. So I want to say to you, I stand by those words. Okay? It is absolutely true. The banks are having difficulty in this region predominantly because the biggest client that they have are governments. And because of the debt situation here, it's, they, they can't lend any more money to the governments. But every time that the credit rating of a country drops, 
it has severe implications to them. So last week, Barbados's credit rating dropped to triple C. So it means the banks now either have to reduce the amount of loans that they have outstanding to the government, or they have to build up reserves to protect and cover the risk that they have on that. So it means that it's less money that they have to earn. They have to now occupy more money that can't go out and be, uh, be lent. And it is having a, a huge cost mm -hmm. implication. The fact that the country, so OECS is very lucky in that we have one monetary council. And generally we tend to harmonize our banking regulations. But Barbados has a separate regulation, Trinidad has a separate regulation, Bahamas and Jamaica have separate regulations. And so for a very small population, there's multitude of regulations that they have to go through and each of these things are very, very costly to the banks. Now the banks play an important role in the development of our countries. and so. Uh, I think that we were able to share with them some of the things that we're doing at the OECS level. Um, and they were able to share some things with us. And then we also had a long discussion about CIP funds. Mm -hmm. Because the Canadian banks have been reluctant to accept CIP funds. But I think that in the discussions there were some clear misunderstandings. And uh, there is a follow-up meeting that's going to be taking place with the central bank and with some of our CIP chairpersons with their risk uh, managers to hopefully resolve some of those problems moving forward. Okay, I hate to speed you up. No problem. The last thing is we met with uh, Prime Minister Philip, uh, Prime Minister uh, Justin. Pierre Judson Trudeau. Mm -hmm. the, the intent really here was Canada used to be our big brother um, and they've disappeared along with the Americans and the British. And so it was a, an, an, an outreach to appeal to them to reconsider coming back into the Caribbean. I have to say that he was extremely receptive. I had the opportunity of meeting with his Minister of International Trade afterwards. But I also met with uh, four elected officials on the Ontario uh, board who were all Caribbean. I mean, one was Grenadian heritage, two of them were Jamaican, and the fourth one was Bahamian. In fact, the Premier's mother is from the Bahamas. So I felt that on the areas of health, education, and security, that there's going to be a tremendous amount of follow-up on the Ontario level. And on the national level, really is in terms of resources and a big brother. Okay, do we have any questions on any of those meetings? Um, HDS? Oh, TBS. Mm. Just on the CIP um, program. Just introduce yourself. Sheffield Gillard, BBS News. Um, Mr. PM, not much has been said about the DSH in recent times, um, nor has there been any progress on the site that work has um, commenced on. Um, the restruct is said to have been ready by this December this year. Uh, can you give us an update on the Pearl of the Caribbean uh, project? Um, the Pearl of the Caribbean is very much alive and I think that when I say some things I, I think that sometimes we don't get into the detail of understanding what I'm talking about. When I talk about the re-engineering of our civil service okay, and of our organizations they're not working. It took eight months to get an EIA approved for the DSH project. It took 10 months to get an EIA approved for the Sabushat project. Not planning approval, you know, the EIA. And when you, when you look at the, the horse racing track, we're talking about 400 horses on a grass track with a, a metal railing on the inside. And previously, there was 400 cows. So in terms of the capacity of the land to be able to absorb the excrement of 400 cows or 400 horses, I got to imagine they're about the same. So we're not going to be able to change St. Lucia if that's the process. It's almost as if everything in this country has become political. And so I think politics has a role to play. And I, I'm certainly not going to be the one um, to railroad things through a process. Um, but to make sure that the country is being protected, there is a much more professional and quicker way that that has to happen. And we've employed UNOPS to assist us in redesigning the Development Control Authority and those approval processes. The second part is that we had an individual who owns land, or sorry, leased land from Invest Solution, um, 
who we were in negotiations with since November of last year to come to an amicable solution for him to be um, uh, moved from that area in cash compensation, land compensation. Um, unfortunately, it got to the point where we had to do a compulsory acquisition. And let's be clear, the compulsory acquisition doesn't mean that he's left high and dry. The compulsory acquisition means that there is a uh, tribunal that will make a decision on what the compensation is. We have still been trying to negotiate an amicable deal. And because he has not moved yet, the project is at a standstill. As legal opposition or as of government business, um, what have you done to ensure that um, all is done, those processes are unknown? Well, as I said, we're, we've hired UNOPS to assist us in looking at to redesign the Development Control Authority. So part of the Development Control Authority process is what we call referral agencies. So we have to send out, first of all, the terms of reference to the referral agencies. That takes a period of time. Then once the, the study comes back, it goes back to them to be able to evaluate to come back. But when I look at many of these referral agencies, the question is, do they have the capacity to do that? Or is it that there becomes a prescribed amount of time that they have to hold it in before that they leave it? And if there's any political mischievous that's being played, they can hold up the process. So other countries basically continue to include that dialogue, but give people time restrictions. And also there's a clear evaluation of the, um, uh, of the referral agency's capacity to participate in the process. Do they have the technical staff? If they don't have the technical staff, are they going to now hire people to be able to do the evaluation on their part? And then the question becomes, the government agencies, which are supposed to be doing a lot of these works, if they've already done it, is that all really necessary? Um, and as I said to you, that, and I think the public would appreciate this as well, because this is not just affecting larger projects in St. Lucia, but individuals who are building homes are also complaining at the length of the time it's taking for planning and the time it takes. So these are some of the things that we're going to have resolved. We're working on getting them resolved very, very quickly, um, because I certainly will know that my own, my government's agenda will clearly be undermined if in fact that this is the level of bureaucracy that we're going to have to be able to achieve what we want to achieve. Okay, uh, PM, I want to focus on well, two things. So the first one, your trip to the Cayman. Mm -hmm. You said that you were part of that was to monitor or to observe on uh, the hospital and the healthcare system. Uh, news just coming in to me over the, well, up until yesterday, was that there was a medical conference over the weekend, the SLMDA held a medical conference, and one of their concerns um, which they seem to be is, think is true, so you could either confirm or let us know whether that's true, is that a company uh, to in the Cayman, and to be exact, it's City Health, Health City, uh, Health City is being uh, tipped to take over, or should I, for lack of a better term, the operations at the OKEU. Can you confirm to us whether this is being considered, whether they have something to do with uh, the completion or the f taking over of the OKEU? So we have been in discussions with several organizations, they being one of them, um, to manage and operate OKU. So, I mean, we've been open with that. Um, there is a Canadian firm. There is the Cayman, the Health City um, firm. Um, there is a, a French group. Um, so there are several groups that have put proposals together that we're looking at. Um, the former government had passed um, a new bill to basically operate OKU as a statutory body, so very similar to St. Jude's. And I think that that's, that's the discussion. I mean, when I went on um, my uh, trips, I've been going around to see different ministries and different um, uh, services, and I went to Victoria. You know, when you go to Victoria and you go to St. Jude's, the, uh, the administration operating procedures is night and day. I mean, you take a simple thing. There are 17,000 people in St. Lucia who have health care insurance. When they go to St. Jude's, St. Jude's is making sure that they bill those insurance companies to collect the money. That's not happening at Victoria. I look at the accounting system at Victoria. I look at the IT system at Victoria. I look at the inventory system at Victoria. Right? So the fact is, is that I don't believe just taking all the staff from Victoria and moving them to OKU because it's a new hospital is going to solve the problem. There has to be a culture. And so if I look here in St. Lucia, the culture that exists at St. Jude is much better. 
in terms of its own sustainability. So you, it's in Jude is operating a facility that was not a, a build or design build, we call it, a pur purposely built facility. It was a stadium. And you go there for yourself and see the cleanliness, see the aptitude. Now that's not to say that people at Victoria are doing a bad job. I'm not accusing or throwing any individual person under the bus at, at Victoria. But I think that the operating system that they have isn't conducive to producing the best healthcare service at the best cost for St. Lucians. So that is why, in part, we're looking at that. And then the second part of that is, how do we create a new revenue stream for, re for, for healthcare? And that one that is, that is equitable. And that's why we're looking to introduce a healthcare insurance that every single St. Lucian will have insurance, regardless of what walk of life you're in. So it means that everybody has equitable access to the hospitals and to healthcare services. But it also means that if you have a PPP project and you have private sector people helping you operate it or exclusively operating the hospitals, that there's a revenue stream. Because right now, I certainly wouldn't want to run anything in St. Lucia with the hopes that the government of St. Lucia was going to pay me for my services. So the answer is they are one of the companies. The, we've made no final decision at this point, and until we know the details of the health care insurance, it'll be difficult to complete that. But we had looking, looked at the possibility of getting them to run the radiology center. And I am pushing very hard to get the dialysis um, room up and running at the OKU as fast as I possibly can. So uh, the advantage of what they're offering from a radiology center is that the maintenance of the equipment, but more importantly, that when the photographs are taken, it goes to India to experts to give you the analysis. So I, I, I'm, so I'm heartbroken when I see solutions go to get an x-ray and they come to you and they're carrying this sheet because nobody's been able to read it. Nobody can interpret what their problems are. They, they can't be diagnosed. So that's as, as, as important as it taking the photograph or the x-ray, it's equally important to be able to have the services to be able to be the diagnosis. But before I get to my second question, can I ask, is the EU okay with that type of arrangement, or the pro that sort of proposal of having a private form of PPP take part or uh, manage uh, a hospital which they basically financed? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. My second question was with the owner of the St. Lucia Stars. You met with him. I'm not, uh, you would be aware that just recently there was some complaints from service providers that they have not been paid for their services. Was this addressed? Uh, can you t enlighten me? I didn't know that at the time, um, but I will be addressing it with him. Are there any other questions in that vein before we move on? Because we'd spend a lot of time on this section. Um, quickly, the Sheffield. St. Jude's Hospital. Um, we were coming to that towards the end, but do you want to? Well, yeah, well, let's just go, because we, we want to talk about the economy. We want to talk about growth prospects. We have very ambitious plans for the economy. What I wanted to, you to do, Prime Minister, is very briefly give us um, an overview of where we are and are we still on target in terms of the direction we want to, to take with the economy? Well, the more visible things um, are the area of tourism. So as I said to you, tourism arrivals are up 10%. Uh, the good part is that some of our higher yielding markets are also up significantly. The cruise industry is up 22%. Um, all the indications are in our advanced bookings that that's going to continue to continue to grow. Uh, Windjammer Landing was semi-closed because they were doing refurbishments. House and Beach Club was semi-closed. Semi so it means that there is another um, uh, 60 rooms from those two properties that are going to come available this winter. And then you have Harbor Club, which is due to open up in Christmas. So that's another 117 rooms. Um, and Royalton continues to find its feet every day. So I'm extremely encouraged by the, where we're going with, with from a tourism perspective. On the uh, offshore financial services, the Headquarters Act that we put in place, um, Digicel have made the announcement or are about to make the announcement um, coming in. And so we're talking about almost 200 people that are going to be moving into St. Lucia. Um, an international bank is also coming. Um, there are two major law firms um, that are trust law firms that are also looking to come into St. Lucia. Uh, a major yacht construction company in the region is looking to move their headquarters to St. Lucia. So that Headquarters Act has actually been going well and the word is getting out. Our CIP program uh, was behind and it was behind because of processing. Um, we were taking too long to get through the approvals um, 
and the levels of communication, the, the, the feedback I was getting in the marketplace was, was, was not great. So I'm very happy that um, we have Mr. Nesta Alfred, who is an extremely experienced regulator. He was with the financial uh, services. He was heavily involved with insurance regulation. Um, he's done compliance with banks. Um, so he has just completed a trip to Asia um, and Dubai, and the feedback is fantastic. So I'm very encouraged in that moving forward that, that we're going to now start seeing the, the pace that we want. In terms of new investments, um, the Sandals Group are putting in 400 suites um, at uh, Sandals, near Sandals Grand. We have um, the Sabasha project, which will be breaking ground before the end of this year. Ritz Carlton, which will be breaking ground early next year. Um, we're also going to be announcing the project out of Canals very soon. Um, so they've just received all their final approvals. So that's will be for 350 rooms and a golf course. There is a major project that we're working on um, for Shock, um, which could potentially be uh, a 400 room hotel. In addition to that, we are uh, close to being able to get the submissions from hopefully at least three, possibly four groups for Hunor Airport, because as I indicated, we have the money. So now that we have the money, it's really to select the group that's going to um, construct the, the, the project for us. We've had very good meetings with um, uh, Carnival in particular with regards to a home port facility in Viewfort. You know, that is to fix up the facility and get it operational. So by, 20, by 2020, the goal would be to, to have that, that fully operational. And that does not obviously include the timelines that we have in place for the DSH project. Um, we will be announcing very soon that we've been able to secure financing to do about 100 million US dollars in um, road rehabilitation. So the $1.50 tax that we've put on, um, which will be in a lockbox, will now go to help fund that $100 million. Uh, we're going to looking to uh, get work to our subcontractors, our local contractors, as fast as possible. But one of the things that we absolutely want to do is to make sure that when we're rebuilding the roads, we're putting wires under the ground. Okay, and so we're starting to build in that resilience for the future. Um, we have a work program for the feeder roads. Um, the other one I'm excited about is our banana production is up around 20 to 30 percent for the year so far. And uh, we've seen uh, no change in our fresh produce. I'm a bit concerned about the fresh produce in that the market for the Northern Islands clearly has become vulnerable. But I'm hoping that we can see a, a, a return to normalcy as much as possible. So uh, all in all, uh, we're very happy as to where we are thus far. But clearly, uh, the bigger things that the public wants to see in terms of real changes in the employment will start coming once the construction projects start getting off the ground. Ojo Lab is open, but will be open in its new home October 15th. Um, I think that we've got 35 people to begin with, um, and then that's going to continue to grow. So the initial part of the project is to get all the kinks out and the me mechanisms working. But uh, when I had the meetings up in Austin and met with some of the other potentially participating companies, I was very optimistic in terms that we're on a winner here. And if you, you know, pick up The Economist, you pick up newspapers, literally every day there's discussions about artificial intelligence um, and call centers. So I am very, very encouraged by those things. So I would say to you all in all, I am very happy where we are. But at the same time, I am mindful, mindful, sorry, that there are still too many people who have not gotten work yet. Mm -hmm. And that some of the things that I'd like to see changed have not changed. Um, but that is not from a lack of trying. And I'm just asking people to recognize that I can't do it in one, one fell swoop. You know, we had a major problem with debt in this country. We have to turn over a billion dollars of, of, of bonds this year and almost 800 million next year. Um, so that really puts the hamstrings, the, the government, severely. Um, we are hopefully going to be able to recommence our programs with the Taiwanese. So we've been in, in a lot of discussions and the, the discussions with the Taiwanese have been simple. I want to see more. I want to see more investment. I want to know that St. Lucia is part of their strategic plan. I want to be able to create trade agreements and financial agreements that would allow more investment to take place in St. Lucia because we're in the same time zone as North America. And so we can become an incubator for smaller companies that can eventually move to Taiwan in their offshore facilities. So 
Uh, I'm very encouraged by the discussions that we've had and making that happen. Okay. Do we have questions on this section? Sheffield? Um, the recent disaster in the region, um, how are we benefiting and from the cruise ship diversions and not only the cruise ships but the hotel sector as well? Um, it's always a ticklish thing for me to talk about because I would hate to think that we're growing or have any dependency on somebody else's failure. So I think this, is, this example is a great example. So we've seen a request for eight or ten increase in calls for this year and another five for next year. But there's a bigger threat. We're too far south. So if Puerto Rico is not operating as a hub, as a home port, it means that we're going to operate out of Miami. And if it's going to be out of Miami, they're only going to make it as far south as Antigua. So I think St. Kitts, as an example, has seen an increase in 75 calls. So basically all the St. Martin calls have gone into, into St. Kitts. Um, so what that tells me is what we're doing in terms of building the facilities in the south is critical in creating our own home port and making ourselves, when we talk about resilience, it's not just about the physical resilience, but it's about the economic realities that are out there. Um, from a tourism perspective, uh, I'm concerned that the world thinks the Caribbean is damaged. Now, how do you come up with a marketing campaign um, uh, to push your destination without people thinking that you're trying to take advantage of your brothers and sisters? So I'm, I'm happy to say to you that we've been working behind the scenes um, with the Prime Minister of the Bahamas uh, to put together a uh, major tourism marketing campaign. Uh, so, you know, we've been trying for a long time be able to make that happen. I'm also saying to you that I'm encouraged by discussions that I've had with the FCCA and particularly led by Mickey Arison that there's a strong likelihood that the FCCA and the cruise industry are going to join that initiative. Um, there's going to be a major meeting in Jamaica at the end of November and I'm hoping that we would have wrapped everything up to have a major signatory at that point. There are two major organizations that are putting on concerts um, with celebrities uh, that helps highlight what's happening in the Caribbean. Um, but the critical one is that we have a data, we have a, an uh, online website that gives people clarity as to who is damaged and who is not damaged. Um, so I think that we will see some pickup in business. Uh, but my goal is, is that we continue to see an increase in business and we make sure that that's sustainable going down the road. I was starting to get a little worried. We were getting no questions from the ladies. <laughs> Janelle? Yes, um, it's Janelle Norville, Choice TV. Um, given that the developer of DSH is perceived to be a spectator in the marketplace, what sort of guarantee does the government have that he's able to front the cost of the first phase? And also, as it relates to the first phase of the project, has there been um, some finalization? Because last we spoke, you said that there was still two aspects um, that were on the table for negotiations. So have we finalized that? Just yesterday, we had um, a very long meeting with his, um, with his team. Uh, so we, I think we've hopefully finalized the last draft. Um, everything is going to his lawyers and to our attorney general, um, and hopefully that we'll be able to sign very, very soon on a, a new supplementary agreement. A part of that supplementary agreement um, has been to break down the project, because I think that we're all getting panicky here because it's this huge project, and we think that they're all one person, um, and so it's really divided out into its separate components, so it's very clear what DSH is doing as individual investors and what role they're playing in terms of planners. Because remember, I said to you that the government of Solution has engaged them, not financially as yet, um, to help us put together a master plan that we're now able to go out and get other people to be able to come and invest in. So we're very close to finalizing that, and we will have a signing, and we'll be very public, like we were with Range, about the details of the agreement that we have. But I'm very encouraged in the direction we're going and I'm very satisfied that they're bringing their own money to the table and that there is financial commitments that they're making as well. So, you, so there is a guarantee um, from the developer to the government that he's able to fund the, the first phase, the money up front? When you say a guarantee, you mean he's putting the money up for the first phase of the project. So I mean I'm not, I'm not the one spending the money. 
all I'm doing is providing the lease. Right? So the, the horse racing track, he will front the money, and there'll be a mechanism for that to be repaid. And once it's repaid, the ownership of the horse racing track is ours. But he's fronting the money for that. Okay? He is also going to be putting up the money for a hotel, an apartment building, and also the, um, the business complex that he's going to be building on Site A. We're also working now on Site C, which is the Il Parata site, which is in terms of uh, uh, reclamation, um, that's where the marina is going to go, that's where the uh, cruise ship facility is going to be going, and also we're looking to be able to put a hotel park. So, um, and the hotel park is really infrastructure for a subdivision, and then we sell off the individual lots. So solutions, people from the, from the region, people internationally will be able to buy those lots very much like a South Beach, um, and be able to build their facilities. Final question in this category right. for yeah. you. Yeah, during the last sitting of the House of Assembly, uh, the member for Castry South, uh, while presenting his negative motion, uh, did point out, or he claimed, rather, that the range developers' agreement was not in accordance with CIP regulations. And he did say, ask that you follow the right procedure as the opposition will react. Now, of course, when you, when you stood, you did not address it, the CIP, which was seen as arrogant by some in some quarters. But uh, could you just speak to the member for Castry South's claim um, regarding the regulations? So CIP doesn't control the money. It has nothing to do with CIP regulations. CIP is just a processing agent. They approve the application. The funds are collected by CIP and then transferred into uh, what they've called an economic um, fund. What I kept on laughing at Mr. Hilaire for, because it's the hypocrisy, okay, and they, they throw out terms and they throw out things and make it look out to be. And we said it when we were in opposition. You came to the House after you passed the, the Act. You never included the regulations of the CIP. He said, oh, it's not necessary. We'll come to the House and we'll debate it at some time. He never did. They brought it in as an SI. So there was never a debate on the regulations. We argued that there was no regulations on the economic fund. So there is no regulations on the fund. The fund goes in, and it's for the government to determine where it wants to send the funds to. If the government decides it wants to take those funds and give it in the form of a loan to a developer, and I'm getting now the land, to her point, as collateral, for that land. So it means I'm taking CIP funds that would have normally gone into the real estate component. I mean, I hope everybody understands how the real estate component works. That you approve the project. So there was four projects that the former government approved under the CIP project. They didn't even adhere to their own standards. All those projects were supposed to have planning approval. Had to be sufficiently advanced in order to know that they were going to happen. None of them were. VOCA doesn't have planning approval, not even submitted a, 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 a drawing of what the project is going to be. They approved the range project under the CIP. There was no, no submission to DCA. Sabusha, same thing. So what we're doing differently, and I've said it repeatedly, is that we're passing legislation to create now um, a, uh, uh, what's it called, a sovereign fund. And in that sovereign fund will be all the regulations, all be the rules, and it'll be independently managed. Because I firmly believe the funds should not be going through the real estate portion. Because when the money goes through the real estate portion, right, they're getting the benefit, the developer gets the benefit of your sovereign, um, your sovereign wealth. He's getting that money capital free. That's free money that they're getting, $300,000. And I'm saying, why should the government leverage the sovereignty of the state and allow a developer to be able to get that money? Whereas I'm saying, let's put the money into the donation, allow the money to go into the economic fund, and now, if I want to, I can lend that money to the developer, because it means that the state is getting the development, plus they're getting their capital back. Versus me saying, I let you take this money, and I close my eyes, and I hold my breath, and I hope that the development takes place. 
And in fact, only one major developer has succeeded in that model, and that's actually range. So you go around the Caribbean, you see that there are all these half-started buildings that are not finished, simply because there's no accountability in that regard. So if Mr. Hilaire was truly interested in CIP, he would have never been the chairman of CIP. Okay? Not only because of his involvement in the Jafali affair, but he knew and he was intending to become a politician. He is the one, and the Labour Party is the one, that have politicized the CIP. And I'm doing everything I can to depoliticize it. The chairman, he's not political. Everybody who knows Ryan DeVoe can't tell me they've ever seen Ryan DeVoe at political meetings or heard Ryan espouse his preference one party over another party. I've put him there, why? Because he took a bank from St. Lucia, a development bank from St. Lucia, and grew it from zero to a major bank. So he has the experience in that area. I've taken a CEO that has all the experience in the world in doing due diligence and trying to professionalize the staff. We're going to separate the marketing component from CIP away from the uh, CIP and put it in with invest. Because there are people who are obviously concerned that you're out marketing and you're approving. And so in, in, in the nuance of the world today, people see that as a conflict particularly in a, in a highly regulated, regulated sector. So uh, I'm committed to being transparent to the people of St. Lucia. We're committed to seeing this program work, and we're committed that at the end of the day, solutions will be able to go to the sovereign fund and see funds. A great example is Norway, and that's who I'm taking my lead from. So Norway has a sovereign fund that has a trillion dollars in it. And all they do is the interest off of that sovereign fund is what goes into the recurrent expenditure. Whereas in Trinidad, the vast majority of the money that they were earning from oil right, went into recurrent expenditure. And so here's how it hurts you. The revenues four years ago from oil in Trinidad was 3.2 billion US dollars. And today it's a half a million. And so that's the problem that's happened. So you've had now four years in which there has been a, a dramatic shortfall in revenue, of which an, if that revenue had been going into their sovereign fund, because they have a sovereign fund, they wouldn't be in the problem they're here today. And I want to make sure that, that we build up this sovereign fund, which is like a big sink fund, and that if there's a disaster or if we need anything, we can look to ourselves. And, I, and I've always learned in life, if you can take care of yourself, then other good things start happening to you. We are pressed for time. I did want to go on to social issues, but um, Sheffield, just ask that question very quickly, yeah. please. Um, considering a few islands lower their CIP threshold lower than ours, how is that going to affect our program? Um, it, makes, it makes the program very competitive, but there's no intentions on our part at this time to lower it any more than it is now. I want to say to Solutions that our, our intention is to make St. Lucia one of the most desirable places in the world to live. And that people are looking to become a citizen of St. Lucia because they want to. Because they think it's a great place. So you got to start somewhere. So we got to let people know that we're in the business of the CIP. And so that's why the price is where it is. Because the cost of me going out to market that idea initially would be very expensive. So as we now start seeing traction taking place, the new campaign that we're going to be putting out to promote St. Lucia, right? I'm talking about how great St. Lucia is, and also fixing it up, getting the hospitals running, getting the infrastructure going, getting a new airport, making View Fort one of the most desirable places to live, right? Those are the things that are going to help fulfill the promise, because a brand position is only a promise. So we have to be committed to making St. Lucia one of the best places to want to live in. Okay. But we must do it first for solutions, and then whoever else comes in here benefits from the standard that we're getting. Okay. Prime Minister, we have a lot of social ills that are affecting our country right now. You know the crime figures, we've had over 14 homicides. Um, we know that there's a correlation between our social programs and crime. What are we doing in terms of social transformation? And also, how are we responding directly to the crime? If you could give us a, a brief overview of this before we take some questions um, in that area. So really quickly, um, 
We are in the process of opening up a, a temporary halls of justice, as we've discussed, on, on Barnard Hill. Um, that will allow us to put all of our courts in one area, which we think that will substantially improve the dispensation of justice. Uh, right now, it's a disaster. People don't even know which building to go to. Um, and every day that we move into a new building, we end up with mold, um, and we're losing a lot of time. Uh, and as I told you from day one, the goal here is the criminals must know that if they get caught, they're going to be tried quickly and convicted quickly. So the first part of it is get my courts working. So you have currently a situation where judges don't even have chambers, right? People don't even know which courthouse they're going to go to. And even when they go to the courthouse, the jury and the judge are literally sitting on each other's lap. The person who's the accused person is, is literally in the face. There isn't the security that's necessary um, for those judges. Magistrates don't have offices. Magistrates are working out of their cars. Magistrates don't have security. So the goal is to really put in a, a proper facility that would allow us to, to, to smooth that out. Then there is the um, uh, policemen, so in terms of investigation. We've got to improve the ability of our policemen to be able to investigate. And so the Canadians and the British um, have been huge supports in that area. Then there is now the DNA lab. So we've got that back up and running, um, but we want to be able to improve the overall facilities of the DNA lab uh, and also to do it at an affordable rate. So I was really impressed when I was in Philadelphia and I got to meet with the mayor there and they were the first police station to receive a new piece of equipment that processes DNA right at the, at the police station in four hours. So the technology is getting better and more affordable. So I, I, I'm going to make sure that we skip the past generations and we can leapfrog into the new generations. Um, the other component to that is policing itself. Uh, the population will see and feel a greater presence of policemen, which starts with traffic. So a no tolerance to traffic violations. And make sure that, that we're actively out in the streets. Fighting crime with force, particularly the type of crime that we have, we don't believe is going to work. Um, young people who feel that they've been disenfranchised by the system are going to react negatively or uh, to people harassing them. Meaning, they already gave up on the system. They don't think the system cares or is compassionate. So when you go around and you start hassling them, it, it, all you're doing is convincing them <laughs> that the system is against them. And it's not getting to the source of the problem. But the source of the problem isn't the social aspect of it. And the solution is not going to be immediate. So it's about changing the value chain that we have. Too many young girls who have a child under the age of 15 second child before they're 17, a third child before they're 18 or 19, a third child by the time they're 21. And that this is now generational. So this is not first generation, not second generation, but third generation. So who is bringing up these young guys? Who is bringing up these other young girls in these households? The mothers are just trying to survive. And that we need to be much more of a compassion because that problem becomes our problem. And it becomes even worse when that child moves away from the rural area and moves into the city and becomes anonymous. Becomes, their new family becomes the gang. And so going out and killing somebody or robbing somebody is to make an impression, not, not out of need. So we've got to be cognizant of what our problem is and how we're going to be able to resolve this problem. So the after school programs that we're putting together are critical. So once we've made a commitment, and we have made a commitment to do it, the next thing is, how do you do it? So we've got um, Don Lockerbie. Many of you may or may or not know him. He was the gentleman that um, did all the venues for the World Cup cricket and works with a huge FFF&E company out of Miami. They did the Atlanta Stadium recently. They're going to be doing the Raiders uh, Stadium in Vegas. Um, so obviously a tremendous amount of experience. He's done an audit of all our facilities in St. Lucia. I think that the last count was 150 sporting facilities in St. Lucia. Okay? So how are you going to fund programs and connect all of those facilities to have a proper after school program? So bringing back clubs in St. Lucia. So it's not simply by saying you're going to have a club. Many people don't even know how to run a club. 
the chairperson, the treasurer, the secretary? How does it work? How do we keep everybody there? And then what are the clubs going to be working on? So each club in our mind has to be primary school uh, uh, students, secondary school students, and then a senior level. And then we need to help them with the coaching so that from the, the hours of 3 o'clock until 6 o'clock that people can go to their club, these different age groups, and they can play football, they can play basketball, or they can do the arts. But it's about now training and getting people up to scratch to be able to run these clubs. Two, to be able to make sure that we have the coaches and we continuously train the coaches. Then it's about running the leagues. So the transportation, the food, making sure that they're leagues. And if you're going to have a club system, that you have a zonal program where you have zonal competitions, then you have a regional competition, then you can have a national competition. Then the next thing is, is that getting kids to become more competitive. So that's what those clubs are. So a very good example, if you want to, is if you go up to the uh, swimming center at, um, at Rodney Bay. I, I think there's about four clubs there. And each of those clubs have those different levels. And even in those levels, so at the primary level you have, you have beginning, you have intermediate, and you have advanced. So this is, has to be a very structured process to make sure that kids have somewhere to go. Critical to that is improve the overall level of competition, get our national sports in those levels to be able to work, and pick disciplines that allow kids to get a tertiary level education. So I mean, we got a report yesterday, it was shocking. 7% of the kids in St. Lucia have a tertiary level education. 36% only have a primary school level education. And 34% have, or 44% have um, a, uh, a secondary school level. It's dismal. And so the curriculum that we have in education is a misfit. And then the standard of education is also a misfit. So when I, 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 I feel it, I go to my constituency, I go to other people's constituencies, I see the state of the schools. We have some schools that are 50 years old or, or older. And we've not spent money for years on maintaining these schools. So I'm being asked as the Minister of Finance, make monies immediately available, which those funds are not necessarily available. Okay? But I believe that the curriculum needs to change. And before you design or build any new buildings or fix up the buildings, you must understand what that curriculum is. And so if you're going to change the design of the buildings, then you know that you're changing the design of the buildings. And we're building schools for the future. So what I've tasked the Ministry of Education to do is give me a sample school for the future. So when I go to other places, like in Canada, and kids are on iPads and the stuff is in the cloud, and you see now schools where the, the sitting is in clusters, and the, the, the interaction with the teachers is completely different because you're teaching communication. You're teaching kids how to think. Our rows of classes and the way that we're teaching, we're teaching kids how to memorize. And so design matters. So design before form. And I know there's an urgency, but we don't have enough money to keep reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And I'm putting tremendous pressure on the civil service who are not, I don't think are being disobedient, but they themselves have lost how to think. Nobody wants to change. Everybody talks about change is necessary. Everybody will agree with you what we're doing isn't working. But nobody wants to change. Nobody's going to take the time to figure out a new structure, a new way to do it. And I'm saying we don't have all this money. I need more productivity from the same money that we're spending. And I, I say this to you because the social program is important. It requires funds. We can stretch the lottery. So the lottery money, imagine lottery money at $600,000 a month. If you had um, 34 uh, facilities, and each facility had four clubs, and each club had four coaches, okay, that would cost, um, uh, I think it was twice as much money as we're currently collecting just for the, to pay the coaches. So <laughs> you, you, it seems like a lot of money. And what I've said is I want the lottery funds not to be going into the construction of buildings. 
okay, or fields. What I want to see the, the lot of money go into is the support of programs. And, and these are the kinds of programs we want to sit. And so I'm hoping, not hoping, I truly believe that between what we're doing in justice, what we're going to be doing with the after school program, um, and what we're going to be doing in developing youth entrepreneurship, that those things will go a long way in really changing um, our own uh, belief about crime. Because the people of St. Lucia must see crime as an enemy. Yeah. Do we have any questions based on what the Prime Minister just said or in this vein? Oh, Reg, microphone. Yes, um, Mr. PM, um, my, con my um, que queries um, relation to um, social welfare. We've seen, um, in the light of the um, upsurge in crime, we've seen the prevalence of young persons involved in crime. Now, what sort of measures would be taken to beef up the social security? We have a lot of um, school dropouts. When these kids drop out of school, there is no track system as, as to what they what they into, what they, and should the social welfare people be more on the field, like in terms of keeping tabs on these kids and relating to the police department as to you know who is a dangerous element and you know that sort of thing, and, and also um, take into account our national security. So when I think of social welfare, I think of um, uh, people who are poor. I think of um, the elderly whose pensions are, are cause them to struggle. There just isn't enough money to be able to go by. And in terms of how we're going to make sure that they, they reach that minimum standard of living that they, 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 they deserve. Um, and we are looking at that, meaning that we're subsidizing um, people by reducing the price of rice flour and sugar. But everybody's benefiting from that. But not everybody needs it. So think of how much money we're spending in supporting a whole bunch of people who can afford to pay for rice, flour, and sugar. And that money could have actually been going to even give greater support to the people who need. So we're saying that we want to put a, a direct social program in place. And, and, and we're working on making that happen. And I'm looking forward to getting the presentation from the Ministry of Equity when it comes to that. With regards to the young people and work, this is why we're saying that the immediate thing we should be doing is working on skills. So kids who are not making it out of, of secondary school or dropping out, in, uh, don't go past sec, uh, primary and are not, let's train them with skills. And immediately, I mean, we can put skills programs in within six, six months. We can give people um, construction. So when we looked at the situation at um, Royalton, why is it that 50% of the people came from outside and there was such a high unemployment rate? It was because the type of construction that they were using now was a new method. And our workers didn't have that skill set. So that's why we want to, particularly in the South, is to, in, in, in this training program we're putting together, is include construction. The hospitality training that we're putting in. The skill set training that we're doing at Ojo Labs. Um, so we believe that shorter term training um, that costs less money, the people that need it will pay for it. The people that can afford to pay, they sign it off on their wages. So when they get back to work, it's a lesser amount to be able to repay on the overall thing. So I have to say to you, the biggest impact we can make is on skills training right now. Um, but there's no point in me going through those skills training if at the same time I'm not creating the jobs. And I think that, you know, when you listen to some of the discourse out there, I think we all get very confused. On one hand, everybody's complaining about the standard of living, I don't have enough money, and then we're talking about development and the conflicts that development create in terms of whether it's the environment or patrimony or anything. And we've got, when we're making a decision, we have to look at all those things and take them into consideration. But right now, we need jobs. And when I look physically at St. Lucia, St. Lucia has a tremendous amount of capacity, physical capacity and human capacity, to be able to grow. And because of our location, because of our size, the choices that we have of things that we can do are limited. And so we already have a head start in tourism, so for the foreseeable future, that is going to be a big component of what we're doing. Agriculture, 
we have a strong heritage of agriculture. We're out there supporting it. We're very happy to hear that the bananas are finally going to France, and we're opening up a new market. Um, the fresh produce, the new marketing board that we're going to be putting in, all those things are to be able to strengthen the agricultural sector that takes land that currently is unproductive and makes it productive. And then in terms of diversification, we're sitting here, the offshore business, so by getting the Headquarters Act in place, making some changes to our financial laws to encourage more financial transactions. Um, the uh, Headquarters Act, bringing companies that are going to need lawyers and, and, um, and accountants and strong administrative people is creating jobs for the future. And so that when young people are now getting those jobs, uh, getting training, that immediately they're going to see the benefit of that. So we're seeing too many young people who are going away to get a degree, mm -hmm. coming back home, thinking I've got a degree, I'm going to start at this level and find out they're not. The, the, the rate of return on that degree isn't there. And so we've got to find new jobs that can now absorb uh, tertiary level graduates into our economy. I wanted to end, Prime Minister, by just returning quickly to an issue that has been popping up um, throughout our conversation. We did a recent media tour of the St. Jude Hospital site, and it was very alarming, some of the things we saw. Also was alarming with some of the numbers that came out from the consultant engineer in terms of how much we've already spent on the hospital. Can you give the people of St. Lucia, before we take quite just a few questions from the media, an idea of what we're dealing with and where we're going? You know, St. Jude's a very sad story. Um, and I think that, you know, when um, the Honorable Stevenson King was Prime Minister and he started this thing, I don't think that in his wildest dreams when he started it that he thought that seven years later we would still be here. You know, so we had a fire. Um, nobody thought of the stadium being in operation that long. And so, uh, and here we are seven years later, $118 million. And I have to ask ourselves, how did we get here? So for me, there will be, there was an audit that was done that was a physical audit. And it clearly showed there were major mistakes that were made. So we've now hired a law firm that is preparing cases against those individuals and those companies. We're also hiring a forensic auditing firm to be able to track the expenditures where they came from, who gave authorities, to be able to help support that particular case. So if I can just for a moment put that aside, because that's not going to change and that's going to be ongoing. But meanwhile, we have a crisis. How do we resolve that crisis? And so the, 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 the report that was given to me is basically saying that it's going to take a lot more money and a lot more time to fix up the current building and make it operational. So on the basis of that, I've now looked at what my alternatives are. And I've reached out to several different people. I've had ideas of my own. My cabinet has had ideas um, in which I'm hoping that over the next couple of weeks that we can come to some kind of conclusion and make a presentation to the public of St. Lucia on how we're going to move forward. But it's not an easy decision um, on how we're going to do it. And meanwhile, Time is ticking. Uh, the facilities at the uh, stadium are inadequate. I don't think anybody is denying that they're inadequate. Um, but they have lasted for the long the period of time. Are there things that we can do now that we know that we're going to be there for a little bit longer to make the situation more comfortable? Um, and then secondly, uh, in moving forward. So when I heard, and you know, and I, I know this is the world that we live in. Okay? Uh, Minister Joseph said, in, in presenting the report that the report said that they would have to demolish aspects of the building in order to be able to move forward. I have said that. Mrs. Mary Isaac said that. And all of a sudden, it comes out that we're demolishing the building. Now, where, why would we demolish the building? So I can say to the public of St. Lucia, categorically, there is no option that I know of that calls for the entire demolition of the building and moving and building a new building. But do I have options where it says, maybe I use the building for something else and I build a new, a new hospital? That is a possibility. 
but I have to look at the cost, I have to look at the time, I have to look at all those implications, and then we will make a decision as quickly as we can to move forward. I have to say to you that we've taken this time because the, the every angle to potentially allow us to move into the existing building is what we started off with. And every time we, we think that we found a solution, we get another problem. Whether it be electrical, whether it be the size of the hallways that you can't get the equipment in, and all of a sudden you start asking yourself, okay, I have to spend the money to do this, it's gonna take me this period of time, is that the best way right now to proceed? But it's a very unfortunate situation that we have found ourselves in. I take full responsibility, not for the past, but I take full responsibility, and my cabinet takes full responsibility for moving forward, and it will make sure that we get the most cost-effective and quickest solution that we possibly can for the people of St. Lucia, but more importantly, give them a hospital that they're gonna be very proud of, yeah, and one that's gonna be really sustainable and operationally very effective. Okay. Sheffield, you had a question on St. Jude, quickly, and then Janelle, and then we'll wrap up. So I, I one. one quick one, okay. One quick okay. Um, why the audit which was conducted on St. Jude's not be officially handed to the Engineers Association of St. Lucia to get an analysis from them as to um, what, what transpired and the way forward, especially when, um, as it relates to the $100 million figure, which, which is said to be, um, which is said ne is needed to complete the, the hospital without any breakdown as to how that figure was um, there. So the company that we used is a company that's a solution-based company that um, are highly regarded by CDB. So in fact, if you check with CDB, um, they will tell you incredibly how effective and, and how professional this company is. In addition to that, the company hired independent uh, auditors. So the company, the local company only did the engineering aspect of it. They had other people that came in to do the technical components to it. Um, there have been several presentations that have taken place. Uh, and I'm satisfied that the quality of the work that's been done is pretty phenomenal. And so the details that you're talking about are there. So every single cost as to what it would be and why it has to be, all that's worked out. So I can tell you, you I mean, for me, politically, <laughs> politically, I would have loved to have had the building open already. That, would, that was priority number one. Absolute priority number one. But again, if we're gonna be creating a world-class destination, and we want world-class healthcare, because we've said affordable quality healthcare is what we think all solutions deserve, right? That according to the report, that the current design in the building will not be able to deliver that. And that because the building is so spread out, all right, um, from an operational cost perspective. And that's why I went to Cayman. I said, you know what? Let me go and see what the difference is for myself. So you went to Cayman, same size, 104 beds, exactly the same square footage, 100,000 square feet. <coughs> had three wings, and it had one big corridor down the middle. So the entire hospital is accessible internally. Where all the beds are upstairs, there's all pneumatic drops. You know what a pneumatic drop is? It's a tube with the air in it. So when they take a blood sample or they take anything, it goes straight down the pneumatic, straight to the lab. The whole thing is completely interfaced. In terms of where the billing is, in terms of the administrative side, all the support, it's simple. <coughs> it's simple. And they spent the same amount of money that we've spent. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So this is my frustration. And it should be everybody's frustration. And I think that that's why we said, you know, people were having a difficulty in understanding it. And we brought the media there. Um, the people who did the study were there with you. <coughs> and I'm happy to do it again and again. That you can go there and you can see, here's what this is going to cost. This is why this is not going to work. I mean, you saw upstairs where the, the, the operating lab was going to be. You saw the ramp for yourself. 
Think of pushing up a, a, a gurney with all the equipment. Think of going down the corridors with a gurney in which you have somebody who's holding the drip and another person who's, who's holding the person's pulse while they're where the camera. Where is the space? Our local engineer association should have some sort of input on the matter. No. Why is that? Because they're an association. I mean, what? What? I don't understand um, how they would be involved. The gentleman who did it is a certified engineer. <coughs> okay, and not only that, is a person that is doing engineering work in Saint Lucia, throughout the Caribbean, and in the world. So when I went to CDB, unsolicited, unsolicited. Right? They said, we would not know what we would do without this guy. He's involved in so many different projects. I mean, do you know how many people he has employed with him? Why is it that we have such a great difficulty in having confidence in what is St. Lucian? And what I'm not going to do is just because a government hires a particular firm doesn't make them a political hack. Where's the credibility? If, if that's the case, do you want me to go back and start questioning all the other things in which NLBA was involved in? Should every, every design that they do, should we now get the architectural firm, the, the association, to review what they have done? The question is, is he a certified proper engineer? Does he have a substantive company? Does he have the capacity to be able to do the job? Okay? Is he a professional? Okay. Who did he bring in? What was the expertise that he brought in to be able to make the allegations he said? Because it's all documented. So the person that is on the account is him. And he will have to sit on the stand during the cases and be the state's witness as to what they've done wrong. And he's going to have to justify it. And he's prepared to do that. But the fact is, is he's a professional. Not a, not, he's not... This idea that we all believe, I mean, I would, I would beg the media, pleading with the media, don't take the narrative. <coughs> if, if somebody said, gives you a narrative, if somebody gives, if somebody gives you the narrative, okay, <coughs> do your own background check. Mm -hmm. Is there any information that you know of that would substantiate the claim that his company is political? It's not. <laughs> okay, let's okay. get a question okay. over um, here. Uh, good day, Mr. PM. Okay, this is my first time here. It's 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 um, quite the experience. Uh, but let me let me just depart from what we've been discussing. Could you thus introduce far. yourself? Uh, Alvin <laughs> Charles, the the Caribbean's leading print and online news um, publication, okay. the the Star. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought that we would have been discussing um, um, impacts, ORC slash impacts, which is why I, 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 I waited a little bit. Um, what what um, um, limitations, Mr. PM, if any? And this is perhaps a question better, better posed to the um, 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 DPP, perhaps even the um, um, National Security Minister or the, or the AG, perhaps. But the, the um, buck stops with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm certain that you will not run away from this question. What limitations, if any, uh, currently impede or fetter efforts to prosecute or even secure any sort of um, um, indictments as far as the impact slash, slash ORC matter is concerned? Um, limitations, including those which may have been born out of the very public thrashing out or prosecution of the matter in the, in the court of um, um, public opinion. You had the... Um, um, former PM, various ministers, political pundits, um, all opining on the matter. So what limitations, if any, has that placed on um, basically buttoning up the impacts issue? Well, I don't, I don't think it's um, just what the former prime minister said or did, but also the, uh, the evidence that was collected, the veracity of it has to be ascertained. So the, 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 the place that that's going to be determined is in the court of justice. Um, the government's role as the prime minister and the minister of security is to ensure that the DPP's office has all the resources necessary 
the DPP would have to make that determination. The DPP is the one responsible for making determination whether he feels that the case has been prejudiced. He has to make the determination whether he thinks the evidence is sufficient because he's the one that's leading the charge. Um, and so uh, I, he's a very experienced person, uh, particularly when it comes to criminal law. So uh, the fact that he is willing or not willing, I mean, we're going to have to wait and see. That's, that's really the determination. So I think that the people are still under questioning and uh, hopefully he makes his determination. If he, dis if he thinks that what the Prime Minister did or that the evidence is insufficient, then he won't proceed. If he thinks that he can overcome that, then he will proceed with the case. But that is a, a, a matter that, that, that only the DPP can answer that question. Nobody else can. You have a follow-up on ORC? No. Oh, okay. Uh, let's get to Janelle quickly. And we need to wrap up. Yes. Okay, given the lack of oversight on the St. Jude's project, um, is there any concern that um, the donor community, especially our diplomatic allies, may have reservations in the future? And if, if yes, then what are you doing to appease them, if anything? Um, I think that's very valid. And so that's going to have to be taken into consideration and in, in, in the options we have moving forward is the financing. So, I mean, if we're deciding that we may want to build a new hospital, where is that money going to come from? And, and do we feel comfortable that we can raise that, that, that type of financing? If we can't, then we have to look for uh, another, another potential solution. But I think that that's why it's important that we did the audit um, and that we're going to pursue it with a forensic audit and that we're going to hold people accountable. It's very, very important. I think the people of St. Lucia demand it, but I think that people's monies who were put into there the people who donated money, they deserve to know that that money is going to be held accountable. And that's why I'm saying to you, I want to keep the two things separate, is that there, that case is absolutely going to go on. Um, I have no idea how, it's going to t how long it's going to take, but we're, we're committed to making the resources available um, for that case. The second part of it is how we're going to solve that problem, and you're very right, and that's going to be, that has to be taken into consideration in, one of, in whatever solution we have. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. I will have you to end with just a few words, a message, few words, <laughs> a message to the St. Lucian people. I think it's important for me to say that um, when we started this mission and when I was in opposition, um, I'm very proud of the manifesto that we wrote. And we've never lost sight of that. And so I know the temptation is always to judge people by their individual actions or um, now that there's a, you've won, all of a sudden it's about um, me. My, myself and my cabinet have not lost sight of what our mission is. So everything that we do is driven by our mission. And our mission is to provide a globally competitive education system for the children of this country. It is to provide a quality affordable health care. It is to make the country secure and to provide economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. In this initial stage, we've said that we need to build a new St. Lucia. Right. You know, people say, PM, you need to tell people more about what you found. You know, there's only so much time in the day, and I only have so much energy. And at this point, when I, when I see the state of my country, and I know how dependent people are in this country are on us doing well, I'd rather apply my time and my effort and my energy on solving the problems. It's not to say I don't want to hold people accountable. But the fact is, that the facts are there for everybody to see. The, the state of, the, of our roads. I was shown pictures today, I'm sure some of the media have been down there, of the state of the sewage system and the water system in Castries. Holes are now popping up in the ground. The state of your schools, go and see them. The state of our public service, when I went to see where inland revenue was, and the sad part is when you walked into Inland Revenue, which you felt like you were walking back into the 80s, on the same floor, same floor of the same building is Invest St. Lucia, which is a modernly designed office plan of a completely standard. So it tells me that somebody knew the difference. I went down to the traffic department. No air conditioning. Desk on the side. Windows can't open. People are holding out windows with sticks. Nasty old bathrooms. My wife has gone to the police stations. No hot water. No kitchen. 
no recreational facilities. That, that's the state that our country is in. I'm not complaining. We're going to get all those things fixed. But it's going to take me, and I've said this from the get-go, it takes three years. It takes me three years to re-engineer the civil service and changing the way that people think, holding people more accountable and getting more productivity. It's going to take me three years to change our culture in terms of how we are processing, getting contracts to farmers so people aren't wasting their time. It's going to take me three years to get the infrastructure of this country fixed. It's going to take me three years to get the finances of this country fixed. A, a billion dollars of bonds have to, have to, to do this year. I mean, I, I don't know if people truly understand the impact of that on, on, on being able to manage your money on a day-to-day -day basis because if those bonds don't renew, there is no sinking fund. You've heard the former government talk about there's no need for sinking funds. The sinking fund is to give you the latitude that if something goes wrong, that you can still run. If, if I don't get a bond turned over, that money comes out of my cash flow. And that cash flow means that something has to pay the price. Somebody is not going to get paid. Some project is not going to happen. So our goal is to restructure this country, fix up the physical infrastructure, fix up the human infrastructure, and change the financings of this country so that we have access to affordable resources. It's when we have those things in place that the country now will be in a position to grow. So when you look back historically as to why is it the country grows one year and then comes back down and goes negative, it's because the capacity for it to grow on a consistent basis isn't there. The other thing that keeps coming up is and I feel very bad about it because the, there's two sets of people that are being impacted the most. My family, who I don't get to see. My constituency. My constituency that voted me in, and I can't be there. Because I have to determine where is my time best placed at this time. I didn't create the I didn't create the the hurricanes, but the hurricanes, you know, Rob Emanuel from Chicago, the mayor, said a crisis is a horrible thing to waste. So it is to take advantage. You saw for yourself. On CNN, every day was hurricane, hurricane, hurricane. The moment the disaster happened in Vegas, the hurricane became the subtitle. And I guarantee you by next week, that's going to be gone. So you've got to strike while the opportunity is there. But my government is committed to delivering to the people of St. Lucia what we need to deliver. And I need your support. I need the media's support. I have no difficulty in answering any question. All I'm asking you to do, do your research. Ask a legitimate question. Focus on what the truth is. You play an incredible role in deciphering for the public what's true and what's not true. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to limit what you can ask me. But I'm, I'm asking that we need to rec recognize that we're collectively involved in this entire process. So could we communicate more? Absolutely. But should it be every dog that barks that I should respond and be determined that I'm arrogant? I don't think so. I don't think it should be determined as being arrogant. I'm going to respond to the things that are, are applicable. And if a person is asking it from a legitimate place, I'm going to answer that question. But I can say to you that we have huge challenges ahead of us, as we always have. But I'm not daunted by those challenges. I'm very proud of the team of people, men and women, that I work with in, in my cabinet. I'm very proud of the vast majority of people in the civil service. I'm incredibly proud of the policemen who, in horrible conditions, still show up to work. The nurses, when we had the explosion, they could have easily said, I'm off work. I'm finished. Those people don't treat me nice. Certain, the places I'm working are, are horrible. They came back. 
And that's to say that solutions are incredible people. Incredible people. And I think we need to focus more and celebrate more on the greatness of solution, a little bit less on the negativity, right? Hold me accountable, hold my cabinet accountable, make sure we're doing the right things, okay? We're gonna try to be as transparent as we possibly can. But I have a very busy fall ahead of me. And while I'm doing that fall, we've moved up the budget time to February. So it means while I'm doing all the things I'm doing, I'm trying to make sure that we stay in touch with what's happening on the budget. Um, we're trying to get the key projects off the ground. And you know, you asked the question, what are we doing to fix the situation with DCA? We've got to fix it. We've got to fix applications for passports. You know, we <coughs> hopefully have gotten an improvement in the land registry. Still not to my extent. I want to get it online. Right? But we are going to make these things happen. But it just takes a little time. Uh, I'm not making any excuses. But you know, when I, I think Rick was the person that talked about we talked the first 100 days. What does the first 100 days mean? <laughs> what can somebody do in 100 days? Right? You know, first 100 days, we delivered on the five to stay alive. You can lay a foundation for the way ahead, perhaps. You can. And, but that's for you to interpret because it's about the policies. But even then, I can tell you, we came in. Uh, the civil service was highly politicized, highly charged. But that's, but that's also for you to um, um, articulate as well. And we can decipher from what is articulated. Hi, Greg. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry. For We're no, starting no, no, another no, press no, conference. No, and, and, and I, I want <laughs> to say, I, I, yes, I that's fine. <laughs> that, that's fine. And, and I agree. And that's what I'm saying to you. But it's, again, I, we've done that. We've articulated our way forward. We've given you what the policies are. We've had a budget uh, a presentation. Right. We've articulated. We continuously meet every Monday mm -hmm. right, uh, during Cabinet. We make the ministers that are available. If there are critical things that are taking place, we're right there in the forefront. But we depend on you to interpret it. And if I may ask one final question, I know that, that the conference is done, I know that we need yes, to Yes, we need to wrap up. Uh, much, much has been made and um, um, continues to be made about the fact that you have not gone down to meet with the potentially, sorry about that. Much has been made and um, um, continues to be made about the fact that you've, you've not gone down to meet with the people who will potentially be affected by the DSH project. My question is, have you gone down there? If not, why? And, uh, and um, are there plans? in the future for you to go down there and, and to meet with those people who will potentially be affected um, by the Desert Star Holding Project? So we have Invest Solutions, the one taking the lead on this, on this project. Um, there have been several town hall meetings by Invest. <coughs> the Minister of Investment has been down there. Minister of Agriculture has been down there. All related people have been down there. I have personally gone down and met with people in different walks of life on my own. Okay. I've indicated that once we have a finalized plan, a, a contract, the new agreement, and I can go and I can say to the people, this is what it is. I have said all I can say, right, that we are committed to the DSH project, the principles of the DSH project, we're behind it. The details were set out in a framework agreement. If in fact we had a final agreement, we would have called it a final agreement. It was a framework agreement because it was there to say we agree to these basic principles and we've been making all these changes. So once that new supplementary agreement is signed, right, I will be the greatest champion. Why? Because in order for a solution to take the next step, the South must achieve. You know, I, I ran in the South because I am committed to agriculture and I'm committed to making the South grow. So the young people in my constituency who want jobs and don't want to have to migrate to the north to get those jobs, I'm committed to making that happen. So those three hotels that are going to get started are critical. The airport that's going to get started, it's critical. The DSH project, it's critical. So uh, as soon as the, the, the agreement is finalized, I assure you I will be down there, but uh, people know and that I have walked the streets I've gone into people's shops. I've met with young people while they're playing sports. I've gone to the bars, and I've listened to them. And that's why I told you. That's where I got the story. And a, a young man told it to me straight. He said, PM, I don't like any politicians. I don't like Kenny Anthony. I don't like you. Right? He said, but 
if this project can happen, it's going to make a difference in my life. So I'm telling you one thing. Be like Nike. Just do it. <laughs> I would like to thank the Honorable Prime Minister. We definitely ended on a nice positive note. Thank you very much for that final question, Mr. Charles. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister, for giving us um, all this time today. Um, we do hope that when you come back from Dominica, we get a chance to talk to you again about some of what you have seen on the ground in Dominica and St. Lucia's efforts um, and OECS efforts going forward in terms of assisting. Thank you so much to the members of the media as well and also to St. Lucia still paying attention to us on NTN and on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.